আলমি গাবা লো দিন স্ট্রেচারিং মেশিন লাইন প্রজেক্ট সাবিও নিরানো Deep learning algorithms have a huge hunger for training data. They just often work best when you can find enough label training data to put into the training set. This has resulted in many teams sometimes taking whatever data you can find and just shoving it into the training set just to get more training data. Even if some of this data, or even if maybe a lot of this data, doesn't come from the same distribution as your dev and test data. So in the deep learning era, more and more teams are now training on data that comes from a different distribution than your dev and test sets. And there's some subtleties and some best practices for dealing with when your train and test distributions differ from each other. Let's take a look. Let's say that you're building a mobile app. where users will upload uh, pictures taken from the cell phones and you want to recognize whether the pictures that your users upload from your mobile app is a cat or not. Oh, hello, sir. Now I'll get two sources of data. And you're going to go. I'm going to go. Error analysis or to go to the home. Hello. I'm going to go. 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 ไม่มาเลยไอ้วิดวิดตัวมาเว้ยอปอมาชิเดเลยอะไรมาเอราอนาไลซิสก็ชิเดฮัลโหลอ๋อโอเคโอเคเอเลสก็กูมาปิดให
you know, up a bound on how much you could improve performance by working on the dog model. And machine learning is something that you always need to see in performance, which just means, you know, what's in the best case, how well could working on the dog problem help you. But now, suppose something else happens. Suppose that when you look at your 100 mislabeled data examples, you find that 50 of them are actually dog images. So 50% of them are dog images. Now, you could be much more optimistic about spending time on the dog problem. In this case, if you actually solve the dog problem, your error would go down from this 10% down to potentially 5% error. And you might decide that halving your error could be worth you know, a lot of effort Focus on reducing the problem with mislabeled dogs. I know that in machine learning, sometimes we speak disparaging of hand engineered things or using too much manual insight. But if you're building applied systems, then this simple counting procedure, error analysis, can save you a lot of time in terms of deciding what's the most important or what's the most promising direction to focus on. In fact, if you're looking at a hundred mislabeled deficit of examples, maybe this is a you know five to ten minute effort to manually go through a hundred examples and manually count up how many of them are dogs. And depending on the outcome, whether it's more like five percent or fifty percent or something else, this in just five to ten minutes gives you an estimate of how worthwhile this direction is and could help you make a much better decision whether or not to spend the next few months focus on try to find solutions to uh, solve the problem with mislabeled dogs. In this slide, we've described using error analysis to evaluate whether or not a single idea, dogs in this case, is worth working on. Sometimes you can also evaluate multiple ideas in parallel through error analysis. For example, let's say you have several ideas for improving your cat detector. Maybe you can improve performance on dogs, or well, maybe notice that sometimes what they call great cats, such as lions, panthers, cheetahs, and so on, that they are being recognized as you know, small cats or house cats. So you could maybe find a way to work on that. Or maybe you find that some of your images are blurry, and it would be nice if you could design something that just works better on blurry images. And maybe you have some ideas on how to do that. So if carrying out error analysis to evaluate these three ideas, what I would do is create a table like this. And I usually do this in a spreadsheet, but using an ordinary text file would also be okay. And on the left side, this goes through the set of images you plan to look at manually. So this maybe goes from one to 100, if you can look at 100 pictures. And the columns of this table, of the spreadsheet, will correspond to the ideas you evaluated. So the dog problem, the problem with big cats, and uh, blurry images. And I usually also leave space in the spreadsheet to write comments. So remember, during error analysis, you're just looking at deficit examples that your algorithm has misrecognized. So if you find that the first misrecognized image is a picture of a dog, then I put a check mark there. And to help myself remember these images, sometimes I'll make a note in the comments so it was a pit bull picture. Um, if the second picture was blurry, I make a note there. Um, if the third one was a lion on a rainy day in the zoo that was misrecognized, then that's a great cat in a blurry day. I make a note in the comment section of your rainy day um, at zoo, and it's a name that made it blurry, and so on. Then finally, having gone through some set of images, I would count up what percentage of these algorithms, or what percentage of each of these error categories were attributed to the dog or gray cat or blurry categories. So maybe 8% of these images you examine turn out to be dogs, and maybe 43% um, gray cats, and 61% were blurry. So this just means going down each column and counting up what percentage of images had a check mark at that column. As you're partway through this process, sometimes you notice other categories of this thing. So for example, you might find that Instagram style filter, those you know, fancy image filters, um, are also messing up your classifier. In that case, it's actually okay partway through the process to add another column like that for the 
LT called it filters or Instagram filters or Snapchat filters. And then go through and count up those as well and figure out you know, what percentage comes from that new error pattern. The conclusion of this process gives you an estimate of how worthwhile it might be to work on each of these different categories of errors. For example, clearly in this example, a lot of the mistakes were made on blurry images, and quite a lot were made on um, great cat images. And so the outcome of this analysis is not that you must work on blurry images. This doesn't give you a rigid mathematical formula that tells you what to do, but it gives you a sense of the best options to pursue. It also tells you, for example, that no matter how much better you do on dark images or on Instagram, uh, images, you at most improve performance by maybe 8% or 12% in these examples. Whereas you do better on gray cat images or blurry images, the potential improvement, at least the ceiling in terms of how much you can improve performance, is much higher. So, depending on how many ideas you have for improving performance on gray cats or blurry images, maybe you could pick one of the two, or if you have enough personnel on your team, maybe you can have two different teams have one work on improving errors on gray cats and a different team work on improving errors on blurry images. But this quick counting procedure, which you can often do in at most small numbers of hours, can really help you make much better prioritization decisions and understand how promising different approaches are to work on. So to summarize, to carry out error analysis, you should find a set of mislabeled examples that would be depth set of your development set and look at the mislabeled examples, both false positives and false negatives, and just count up the number of errors that fall into various different categories. During this process, you might be inspired to generate new categories of errors of the sort. You're looking through the example, you say, gee, there are a lot of Instagram filters, Snapchat filters, they're also messing up my crossfire. You create new categories during that process. But by counting out the fraction of examples that are labeled in different ways, often this will help you prioritize and give you inspiration for new directions to go in. Now, as you're doing error analysis, sometimes you notice that some of the examples in your death sets are mislabeled. So what do you do about that? Let's discuss that next video. And let's see, I don't know အဲ့လိုက်တာဘယ်လိုပြီးတော့အတန်တိုးနေတာလို့နှစ်လို့ဖြင့်မနေ့ကဘရိုင်းအတန်တာအကောင်းကန့်ကျစ်ကျယ်
ဟာဟုတ်ကဟိုဟာကဒီမှာဆိုလို့ရှိရင်အခုတို့ကိုရဲ့ဘောလေးရဲ့ပာဖော်မန်စ်ကိုတင်ရမယ်ဆိုတော
เอ่ออันนี้แอปพลิเคชันเนี่ยอัพไปจองโหกูเรียกเอ่อมอนิเตอร์ตัวอยู่มิสคลาสสิฟายขึ้นตาวะดาซอลูชั่นเนี่ย
you find that the label missed a cat in the background, so um, you put a check mark there to signify that example 98 had an incorrect label. And maybe for this one, the picture is actually a picture of a drawing of a cat rather than a yellow cat, and maybe you want the label to label that y equals zero, rather than y equals one. And so um, you put another check mark there. And just as you count up the percent of errors due to other categories like we saw in the previous video, you also count up the fraction or percentage of errors due to incorrect labels, where the y value in the dev set was wrong, and that accounted for why your learning algorithm made the prediction that differed from what uh, the label on the data says. So the question now is, is it worthwhile going in to try to fix up you know, this 6% of incorrectly labeled examples? My advice is, if it makes a significant difference to your ability to evaluate albums on your dev set, then go ahead and spend the time to fix the incorrect labels. But if it doesn't make a significant difference to your ability to use the dev set to evaluate cross layers, then it might not be the best use of your time. Let me show you an example that illustrates what I mean by this. So three numbers I recommend you look at to try to decide if it's worth going in and reducing the number of mislabeled examples are the following. I recommend you look at the overall dev set error. And so in the example we had from the previous video, we said that maybe your system has 90% overall accuracy, so 10% error. Then you should look at the number of errors or the percentage of errors that are due to incorrect labels. So it looks like in this case, 6% of the errors are due to incorrect labels. So 6% of 10% is 0.6%. And then you should look at errors due to all other causes. So if you made 10% error on your dev set and if 0.6% of those are because the labels are wrong, then the remainder, 9.4% of them, are due to other causes, such as misrecognizing dogs, gray cats, gray cats, and blurry images. So in this case, I would say there's 9.4% worth of error that you could focus on fixing, whereas you know the errors due to incorrect labels is a relatively small fraction of the overall set of errors. So by all means, go in and fix these incorrect labels if you want, but it's maybe not the most important thing to do right now. Now, let's take another example. Suppose you made a lot more progress on your learning problem. So instead of 10% error, let's say you brought the errors down to 2%. But still, 0.6% um, of your overall errors are due to incorrect labels. So now, if you were to examine a set of mislabeled dev set images, so set that comes from this 2% of dev set data you mislabeled, then a, large, a very large fraction of them, 0.6%, uh, divided by 2%, so that's actually 30% rather than 6% of your labels, um, of your incorrect examples are actually due to incorrectly labeled examples. And so errors due to other causes are now 1.4%. When such a high fraction of your uh, mistakes, at least as measured on your dev set, are due to incorrect labels, then it maybe seems much more worthwhile to fix up the incorrect labels in your dev set. And if you remember the goal of the dev set, the main purpose of the dev set is you want to really use it to help you select between two cross by but the algorithm that trains it and it worked. Mistakes, at least as measured on your dev set, are due to incorrect labels, then it maybe seems much more worthwhile to fix up the incorrect labels in your dev set. And if you remember the goal of the dev set, the main purpose of the dev set is you want to really use it to help you select between two cross files A and B. So we're trying out two cross files A and B, and one has 2.1% error, and the other has 1.9% error on your dev set. But you don't trust your dev set anymore to be correctly telling you whether this cross file is actually better than this because the 0.6% of these mistakes are due to incorrect labels, then there's a good reason to go in and fix the incorrect labels in your dev set. Because in this example on the right, it's just having a very large impact on the overall assessment of the errors of the algorithm. Whereas an example on the left, you know, the percentage impact is having on the algorithm is still smaller. 
Now, if you decide to go into your dev set and manually re-examine the labels and try to fix up some of the labels, here are a few additional guidelines or principles to consider. First, I would encourage you to apply whatever process you apply to both your dev and test sets at the same time. We talked previously about why you want your dev and test sets to come from the same distribution. The dev set is sort of telling you where to aim the target, and when you hit it, you want that to generalize to the test set. So your team really works more efficiently if the dev and test sets come from the same distribution. So if you're going in to fix up your dev set, I would apply the same process to the test set to make sure that they continue to come from the same distribution. So if you hire someone to examine your labels more carefully, do that for both your dev and test sets. Second, I would urge you to consider examining the examples your algorithm got right as well as ones it got wrong. It is easy to look at the examples your algorithm got wrong and just see if any of those things. But it's possible that there's some examples that your algorithm got right that should also be fixed. And the only fixed ones that your algorithm got wrong, you end up with a, a bias estimate of the error of your algorithm. Um, it kind of gives your algorithm a little bit of an unfair advantage. You just try to double check what it got wrong, but you don't also double check what it got right. Um, because if I had gotten something right, that it was you know, just lucky wrong and fixing the label would cause it to go from right to be wrong on that example. The second bullet isn't always easy to do, so it's not always done. Um, the reason it's not always done is because if your cross file is very accurate, then it's getting a lot fewer things wrong than right. So if your crossfire has 98% you know, accuracy, then it's getting 2% of things wrong and 98% of things right. So it's much easier to examine and validate the labels on 2% of the data. And it takes much longer to validate the labels on 98% of the data. So this isn't always done, but it's just something to consider. Finally, if you go into your dev and test data to correct some of the labels there, you may or may not decide to go and apply the same process for the training set. Remember we said that the scientist video is actually less important to correct the labels in the training set. And it's quite possible you decide to just correct the labels in the dev and test set, which are also often smaller than the training set. And you might not invest all the extra effort needed to correct the labels in the much larger training set. This is actually okay, and we'll talk later this week about some processes for handling when your training data is different in distribution than your dev and test data. Learning algorithms are quite robust to that. It's super important that your dev and test sets come from the same distribution. But if your training set comes from a slightly different distribution, often that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. I will talk more about how to handle this later this week. So I'd like to wrap up with just a couple pieces of advice. First, deep learning researchers sometimes like to say things like, oh, I just fed the data to the algorithm and I trained it and it worked. And you know, there is a lot of truth to that in the deep learning era. There is more feeding data to an algorithm than just training it and doing less hand engineering using less human insight. But I think that in building practical systems, often there's also more manual analysis and more human insight that goes into these systems and sometimes deep learning researchers like to acknowledge. Um, second is that somehow I've seen some engineers and researchers be reluctant to manually look at examples. Maybe it's not the most interesting thing to do, to sit down and look at a hundred or a couple hundred examples to count up the number of errors. But this is something that I still do myself when I'm leading a machine learning team and I want to understand what mistakes is making. I will actually go in and look at the data myself and try to count up the fraction of errors. And I think that because these, you know, minutes or maybe a small number of hours of counting data can really help you prioritize where to go next. I find this a very good use of your time and I urge you to consider doing it if you build a machine learning system and you're trying to decide what ideas or what directions to prioritize things. So um, that's it for the error analysis process. In the next video, I want to share with you some thoughts on how error analysis fits into how you might go about starting out on a new machine learning project. Oh, Bobby? That's it? Alex
ஆக்டிவிட்டி நேரால் ஆக்கி நீங்கள் போனால் நிறைய நாளை இது லாவாக போகணும் டிமாலே இமே டிமே சொன்னால் புனா அது டி டி டோ நாளை இப்படி பாய் போகணும் ஹார்டலே டாய் ஹியூமன் யாத்தே டாய் லெவலி லவுட் லெவலி லவுட் இஸ் அப்போ அந்த மாதிரி பேர் அடியா டவுன் சொன்னால் ஜாமோனா காசுங்க அந்த மாதிரி பேர் வச்சு இன்ட்ரோ போக உடனே புரியாது நான் மிஸ்டேக் காசு ஆக்கிட்டு இருக்கேன் அது மாவி லோ மூங்க அவ்வளோ மூங்க ไอ้มาเลยสรีทามีเซกลองนี่นั่นลงหมดเนาะนี่มาอินคอร์เรกต์ลีเวอร์เนี่ยมิสคลาสิฟายเลเวอร์เนี่ยมีบอกไอ้
ဟလာအမြာကြီးတော့ဒီဒီတို့ပွားစီပမာနာအကြောင်းဖြစ်တယ်လို့ဆိုတော့မညီရလေးကိုတော့တော်ဤကိုအချိန်ကြောင်းပ
ดิฮามาเลยเอาละมาเลยมาเลยอย่าเดี๋ยวเบนเดซิไปมาเลยเดี๋ยวเราลงนี่จ้ะเดี๋ยวมาเดี๋ยวเราพาไปอีเอ็
And if you get it wrong, you can always move it later, but just set up a target somewhere. And then I recommend you build an initial machine learning system quickly. Find a training set, train it, and see, start to see, and understand how well you're doing against your dev and test set and evaluation metric. When you build your initial system, you then be able to use bias variance analysis, which we talked about earlier, as well as error analysis, which we talked about um, just in the last several videos, to prioritize the next steps. In particular, if error analysis causes you to realize that a lot of the errors are from the speaker being very far from the microphone, which causes special challenges to speech recognition, then that would give you a good reason to focus on techniques to address this um, it's called far field speech recognition, which basically means handling when the speaker is very far from the microphone. A lot of the value of building this initial system it can be a quick and dirty implementation. You know, don't overthink it. But a lot of the value of your initial system is having some learned system, having some trained system allows you to look at this bias and variance to try to prioritize what to do next, allows you to do error analysis, look at some mistakes to figure out sort of all the different directions you could go in, which ones are actually the most worthwhile. So to recap, what I recommend you do is build your first system quickly, then iterate. This advice applies less strongly if you're working on an application area in which you have significant prior experience. It also applies a bit less strongly if there's a significant body of academic literature that you can draw on for pretty much the exact same problem you're building. So, for example, there's a large academic literature on face recognition, and if you're trying to build a face recognizer, it might be okay to build a more complex system than the get go by uh, building on this large body of academic literature. But if you're tackling a new problem for the first time, then I would encourage you to really not overthink um, or not make your first system too complicated, but just build something quick and dirty and then use that to help you prioritize how to improve your system. So I've seen a lot of machine learning projects, and I've seen some teams overthink the solution and build something too complicated. I've also seen some teams underthink it and build something maybe too simple. But on average, I've seen a lot more teams overthink and build something too complicated than I've seen teams you know, build something too simple. So um, I hope this helps, and if you are applying to your machine learning algorithms to a new application, and if your main goal is to build something that works, um, as opposed to if your main goal is to invent a new machine learning algorithm, which is a different goal, if your main goal is to get something that works really well, I'd encourage you to build something quick and dirty, use that to do bias variance analysis, use that to do error analysis, and use the results of those analysis to help you prioritize what to build next. Oh, Bobby, oh, Bobby, let's do a video on the M, or not let's do a quiz by Tima Sorry. Hello, so Doga. And I saw more than Tali Lettini, sorry. The Halia, the Dolly account, and I'm doing another. I'm doing nothing. I never saw young over them alone. Never, I was doing news and there over them. Look at one simple way to pull on my teacher to read the movie. One of the movies are ten page and never know. But then I did an asylum by young over them alone. They never know. Oh, Bobby. เนี่ยแน่นอนบ่เนาะแล้วสุดที่มาส่วนนี้ตัวกว่าดีสปีดเรกเกอร์เนชั่นสิสเตอร์กว่าลงมาสุดๆเนาะอะมาสุดที่ห
ตะคูซาลุบไลติอะมันน่ะซาบไปเนี่ยอายายโอเวอร์ติ้งลุบหมดนี่เนี่ยบ่เนาะไอ้ซูลูมิโอซูนฮะกอปะคูลุบไม่